Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I'm going to tell you about one quick thing. A new book available from tonight's author, T.W. Grimm, Mrs. Blackmore. It's available now on Amazon. You can find more in the link in the description down below. And now, on to tonight's story. Whenever the question, what's the worst job you ever had, comes up in conversation, I usually just make something up on the spot, but I honestly don't really know how to answer. See, the worst job I've ever had also happens to be the very best job. I know it's a bit of a contradiction, but allow me to tell my story from the beginning, and maybe, maybe it'll make a little more sense by the time that I'm done. When it comes to job hunting, I, I wasn't in a position to have a more specific employment preference beyond someone who will hire me and reliably hand me a paycheck every week, so I hardly even paid attention to what kind of business I was applying to. I just slink up to the reception counter and force my resume into the hands of whoever was foolish enough to make eye contact. Not an exact science, by any means, but it usually worked. Someone would eventually give me a job and life could continue on as usual. So there I was. In June of 1996. 24 years old and freshly laid off from a shitty temp job at an equally shitty factory. Once again, I found myself pounding the pavement with a file folder of resumes clutching beneath my arm. I handed out over a hundred of them and received exactly two phone calls from prospective employers. One of the offers was an obvious pyramid scheme involving steak knives and the other... The other offer was downright bizarre. He was for a position as an assistant caretaker at a zoo. Now, it, it's true that I had a tendency to zone out when I was trudging around the city with my resume in hand, but I, I definitely would have remembered applying for a job at a zoo. In fact, I was pretty sure our city didn't even have a zoo. The gruff-sounding guy on the other end of the line got straight to the point. He cleared his throat and rumbled, Hey, kid, how you doing? So, you applied for a job over at my dealership, and uh, am I right? I don't need no help over there right now, but I could really use an extra hand at the zoo. You got a vehicle, kid? This place is way out of the outskirts of town. I told him I did indeed own a car, a rusty old 83 LeSabre that was patiently waiting to die and go to Buick Heaven. He said, well, I checked some things out, and long story short, job's as good as yours if you want it. I was only 24, but that was plenty old enough to know something's fishy if an employer hires you over the phone without so much as a brief interview. Even so, I agreed to come out there and give it a shot, because I simply had to see what the hell this guy was on about. I mean, why could I resist? He told me to show up around 8 o'clock in the morning. Ring the buzzer at the gate, he instructed me and ask for Vic Bonicelli, you know, like the commercial on the radio. Come on down to Bonicelli Motors, we'll give you a steal of a deal, and put you behind the wheel. Yeah, that's me. I said, oh, I'm gonna work for a celebrity. We shared a polite laugh. I told him I didn't have any experience working at a zoo, but Vic assured me that it wouldn't matter. I'd be following basic instructions from the expert, who would always be nearby when we were working with the animals. Don't worry, you're gonna love it. Everyone loves the zoo, am I right? In the background, I heard a man yell, Hey, Victor! Truck's still waiting at the gate! The guy is starting to get mad! Vic yelled back, He just drove for 18 hours! Five more minutes ain't gonna kill him! He returned his attention to me and groaned, Christ, it never stops around here. I gotta go, kid. I'll see you tomorrow. The line went dead. I looked at my phone with a raised eyebrow and a weird feeling tingling in my guts. I wasn't sure what had just happened, but I somehow just became an assistant zookeeper for some shady dude who owned a popular used car dealership. As bizarre as it sounded, however, I was still young enough to consider it an adventure. What the hell, right? That was the worst that could happen. As it turned out, I'd driven past this place literally dozens of times over the years, but I always assumed it was a scrapyard. The property was surrounded by an enormous sheet metal fence that must have been almost 20 feet high. I could recall sometimes seeing the mast of a crane poking out over the top of the fence. If there was a zoo behind these walls, it was certainly not open to the general public in any way, shape, or form. 
I bumped my way along a pothole-infested entrance lane and stopped in front of an intercom on a pedestal. I pressed the button and stared at the gate as I waited for a response. It was made from a large section of wall that had been cut out and reinstalled as a massive rolling door. The effect was decidedly uninviting. A tinny voice squawked, Who's this? What do you want? State your business. I said I was there to start my training as the caretaker's assistant, and the voice exclaimed, Oh shit, I forgot you were supposed to show up this morning. I'll be right down. A minute or two later, the gate rolled open and revealed a burly, middle-aged man sitting behind the wheel of a golf cart. He was wearing mirrored sunglasses and a baby blue Lacoste tracksuit. One sleeve was pushed up a bit to show off a gold Rolex. His graying hair was combed straight back and pasted in place with hair gel. He glistened in the sun. Vic Bonicelli didn't look like a guy who owned a used car dealership and produced hilariously low-budget commercials for our local radio station. No, he looked more like a mobster. He leaned down to my window and said, This is it, kid. Welcome aboard. You'll like working here. Every day's an adventure. Vic slapped the hood of my car and grimaced in dismay. He hollered, well, Just look at this poor old gal. She's almost ready for retirement. I'll tell you what. Save up a paycheck or two and come down to the dealership. I'll give you the employee discount. I manufactured a smile and said, Thanks, Mr. Bonicelli. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, I gotta say, I was pretty surprised this place is actually a zoo. It, uh, well, it <laughs> doesn't look like a zoo. Well, uh, we'll get to that in a bit. And don't give me none of that Mr. Bonicelli stuff. You call me Vic. Anywho, just drive straight up to the parking lot. I'll show you around from there. First thing I noticed when I drove past the gate was a smooth transition in the road surface, changing from pothole-ridden gravel to smooth and flawless asphalt. The driveway was bordered on either side by a wrought iron fence. The ground stretched out on either side in endless acres of green lawn and exotic gardens. It was almost surreal. From the outside, this place looked like a scrunchy old junkyard, but a real-life Garden of Eden was hidden away behind the wall. This was definitely no ordinary zoo, and Vic Bonicelli was no ordinary car salesman. The road led to a small parking lot in front of a massive building. It had been built in a slanting, postmodern sort of style, replete with an overhang that was supported by concrete pillars. A monolithic, glowing marquee on top of the overhang read, Welcome to Bonesaw Vic's Cryptozoological Gardens. A one-of-a-kind experience. I stared up at the sign as I pulled into the parking lot, and I wondered if it was too late to just throw the Buick into reverse, turn the hell around, and ask Vic to open the gate. Looking at that sign gave me a disquieting feeling in the pit of my stomach. My basic survival instincts were telling me loud and clear that I should probably get the fuck out of here immediately. Vic came putting along in his golf cart and beckoned me to follow him to the front entrance. There was a hulking fellow in a dark suit standing on either side of the doorway. Both of them had an automatic rifle slung over their shoulders. He stared at me with open hostility as Vic ushered me inside. Vic noticed the nervous expression on my face and patted me on the back. I don't worry about them, kid. They won't bother you unless I tell them to. <laughs> I already told you. You're gonna like it here. Best job in the whole world for someone like you. The entrance vestibule was so big and flashy looking, I thought it was a lobby. The actual lobby was nothing short of stunning. It was the size of a high school gymnasium, and the floor was made of polished marble. There was a heart-freezing sculpture in the middle of the room, a hyper-realistic statue of a six-headed serpentine monstrosity. It stood at least 12 feet high, and it was absolutely horrifying. I asked Vic what he'd meant when he said, someone like you, and he barked over his shoulder, what do you think I mean? Some of the record. You've been busted once for possession with the intention to distribute, and one more for breaking and entering. You got off with a slap on the wrist for the possession charge, but you got four months in the clink. Three years of probation for the B&E. Still on probation for another 18 months, am I right? Got a record, it'll keep you from getting a lot of decent jobs. I wasn't surprised Vic had found out about my past transgressions, but I wasn't exactly thrilled either. I muttered, no, it doesn't help me, that's for sure. I don't usually go for anything that requires a, a background check. He clapped a meaty hand on my shoulder and boom. Well, let me tell you something. 
I don't discriminate against people like you in my hiring process. Just the opposite. I don't want some crybaby snitch working for me. I want good people who know how to keep their mouth shut. <laughs> anyway, we never got a chance to discuss your wages, did we? How about, uh... How does 25 bucks an hour sound? Good with that? No, no, I'll tell you something. Back in 1996, 25 bucks an hour was some good fucking money. As a point of reference, my recently terminated position as a temp at the factory had paid a whopping $6.40 an hour, which was still above the minimum wage at the time. People with no special training or skills simply didn't make that kind of money. I stopped dead in my tracks and sputtered. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. But can you repeat that? How, how much? Vic furrowed his brow. What's the matter? Not enough? No, I get it. I guess I, I could go as high as, uh, let's, let's say 27 bucks an hour. How about that? Are we good? I, I almost fainted from the force of the pure ecstatic gratitude that flooded every cell of my being. I croaked. Oh, man. Wow, yeah, we're good. We're good. Thank you. Hey, what can I say? Vic grinned. I'm like that Ford guy. I believe my employees should be able to afford my cars. <laughs> you don't see any junkers out in that parking lot, did you? Seriously, I won't be paying you like this over at the dealership. This here, this is different. It was a good job, kid, but sometimes... Sometimes it ain't gonna be easy. You'll see. There was a small group of people waiting for us on the other side of the lobby. They were all wearing what appeared to be some kind of full-body chainmail suit, I believe with a chainmail hood. And as we drew closer, I could see that it really was chainmail, along with knee-high leather boots and matching gauntlets. Each one of them had some kind of rifle over their shoulder, as well as a utility belt of gadgets that would have made Batman envious. All of a sudden, that warm, fuzzy feeling from the anticipation of a sweet-ass paycheck shriveled up and disappeared. Vic didn't look like a car salesman. Those people didn't look like zookeepers. They looked like post-apocalyptic warriors. A tough-looking older guy with a heavy mustache stepped forward to greet us. He took one look at the expression of my face, shook his head at Vic, and said in a heavy Eastern European accent, You did not tell him, did you? Vic shrugged and sighed. Nah, no, well, shit. Look at the time. I gotta go, kid. This is Casimir, okay? He knows his shit. He's your boss. Listen to him, you'll be fine. Oh, yeah. Payday's Friday. Cash only. He turned back to the tall, grim-faced stranger and said, Take care of him, Kaz. Seems like a nice young fella, you know. Keep him out of the way for, uh, for now. Show him the ropes. I waved my hand to get their attention and said, Hey, uh, I gotta be honest here, Vic. I don't really know about any of this, you know. I don't... Casimir cut me off by seizing me by the arm and swiftly dragging me away. His grip was like iron. He yelled over his shoulder, Not to worry, boss. I'll keep him safe and teach him what he must learn. I struggled in his iron grip and snarled, Let the fuck go of me, weirdo! What the hell is this place? Why are you wearing that shit? The fuck is going on here? Why? A fair looking woman with angular features interrupted my rant with a loud clap of her hands. She said, If you shut your stupid ass up for a second, he'll tell you what's going on. Just shut up for fuck's sake. The others smirked and nodded in agreement. I counted seven of them in total all of them clad in chainmail armor and what appeared to be some kind of Kevlar bodysuit underneath. As I looked around, it abruptly dawned on me that we were actually eight of them, not seven. I was number eight. First of all, Casimir grumbled, you must know that I just saved your life. Tell me, do you have a wish for death? I gaped at him and croaked, excuse me? The hell are you talking about? Casimir curled his lip at me in disdain and said, you are not a very observant young man. Look around you. All these things you see, they cost more money than you could ever imagine. Where do you think this money comes from? The sales of used cars. This place is a secret, and for good reason. I felt my heart drop in my shoes. My youthful enthusiasm for adventure had fucked me over once again. I said, this isn't actually a zoo, is it? Casimir considered my question and made a seesaw motion with his hands. Hey, the answer is not exactly yes, but not exactly no either. There are living creatures on display, but only the very rich and powerful may come to see them. They pay a fortune for this privilege. This place is secret. Very few people know of its existence. I felt 
dark, absurd laughter bubbling in my chest. And I clamped down on it hard. This wasn't a joke. I asked, what kind of living creatures are we talking about? Are you people poaching endangered species or some illegal shit like that? I mean, I don't, I don't have a freaking clue what's going on here. They were captured in the wild. This is correct. But I should not have used the word living. Casimir corrected himself. Some of these things, they are not technically alive. I did a double take and said, wait a minute, what? Casimir pointed at the sign hanging above the exit, a reinforced steel door with a small rectangular window at eye level. There was a sign above the door that read, caretakers must work in pairs. All caretakers must be armed and suited up in the required protective equipment before entering this area. I wish to make something very clear to you, he growled. Today you are only a visitor. You will stand back and you will do exactly as you are told. Do you understand? I gawked up at his stern, hawkish expression and murmured, Yes, sir, absolutely. I felt like a lost child, all alone. And very afraid. The feral-looking lady snickered at me and said, Poor baby, look at his face. Looks like he's gonna cry. Just wait until he sees what's on the other side of that door. Casimir waved her away and scolded. There is no need to speak like this, Esmeralda. You were no better on your first day. He pulled me over to the door and entered a code on the keypad. The door popped open with a buzzing sound and a mnemonic hiss. And there it is, Kaz said, as he gave me a numbing smile. It is time to begin your education. We all filed into a short, brightly lit corridor, and the entrance swung shut behind us with the clunk of a heavy deadbolt automatically sliding into place. There were two doors on either side of the hall, and a fifth at the end that was labeled Equipment. The others were marked Aviary, Marine, Terrestrial, and... Other. Casimir informed me that we would be in charge of the Terrestrial Wing that week. The caretakers worked in pairs, and they rotated to a different wing on a weekly basis. He punched a code into the keypad beside the door and said, in an ordinary zoo, they would wish for the animals to become more familiar with their handlers, but such things do not matter here. Most of these creatures will never become fond of you. A lot of them will kill you if they get the chance, Esmeralda interjected. They'll kill you deader than dog shit, Man, they'll eat you. Not necessarily in that order. I didn't like the sound of that. Not at all. I ran my hands through my hair and said, Oh, okay. Sure. Cool. So here's where I'm at right now, okay? I'm not stepping one foot through that fucking door until somebody tells me what the ever-loving fuck is going on in this place. Cryptids. Esmeralda smiled. And she pantomimed scary monster hands to further illustrate her answer. Critters from legends and folklore. There's all kinds of weird shit in here, and it's our job to take care of them. There, they're all up to speed now. I blinked at her for a few seconds, then wheezed. What? You're kidding me, right? Stuff like that doesn't... I mean... It's not real. Casimir arched an eyebrow and said, Come see. He yanked me through the door before I had a chance to scream for help. It swung shut behind us and locked with a muted clunk of multiple deadbolts sliding into place. This new corridor was narrower and much, much longer than the first one. It was lined on either side with more steel doors, most of them set apart at roughly 50-foot intervals. I gazed down the length of that stark, brightly lit stretch of corridor, and I thought, This doesn't look like a zoo. It looks like a prison. Kaz made a sweeping motion with his hand and said, This is the surveillance tunnel. The visitors observe the creatures from the other side of its habitat. There are large windows and video screens. I leaned against the wall and said very weakly, I... I don't care. I, I want to go home. Casimir shook his head. He put his hand on my shoulder and patiently explained that I wouldn't get even as far as the parking lot. They'd be intercepted by security and I would disappear, never to be seen again. The only way to earn Vic's trust was to go along with it 
and in Cosmere's words, get paid handsomely to have a wondrous experience. I listened to his somber speech and offered a rebuttal. I, as a reasonable and rational person who lived in the real world, was in no way, shape, or form even remotely prepared to come face to face with a, a monster from the pages of a fairy tale. I simply had no interest in doing so. Not then, not ever. I pointed out I was being held against my will, and I cautioned him that I was liable to explosively shit my pants if he forced me to interact with some fairy tale monster. It, it wouldn't be on purpose, of course. But it would probably happen because I wasn't a fucking monster wrangler. I was a reasonable and rational person who lived in the real world. Do you really want to deal with that? I demanded. Cosimir gave me an irritated frown and shrugged his heavily padded shoulders. You can defecate inside your own pants if you wish, but it will not help you. Now listen carefully to me, boy. The service tunnel is where the caretakers gain entrance to the habitats. There is a red button beside every keypad. If something were to go wrong, you must quickly press the button. It will alert the security team, and it will also release a defense mechanism, which will subdue the creature inside. The red button is always a last resort. Do not push it unless I tell you to do so. There was a brass plate affixed to the door, and the words Sasquatch, male, were etched above its surface in bold lettering. Casimir said, have a look through the window. What do you see? I swallowed down a hard lump in my throat and peered through the observation window. Much to my surprise, there was a dimly lit forest scene on the other side of the glass. There were living trees growing in the room, along with various other flora and fauna that you would find any woodland in the northwest. I turned to him and gasped. There's like a frickin' forest in there. How high is that ceiling? Holy shitballs, they brought in trees and bushes from all that shit. I can't... Hey, what's that? A looming shape detached itself from the thicker gloom of the shadows. It started shambling towards the door, and when it stepped into a hazy beam of sunlight, I let out an involuntary shriek of terror. It was a furry humanoid that stood at least eight feet tall, a muscular pillar of shaggy hair, dangling arms, and glittering eyes. I stood frozen in place as it came strolling up to the door, too terrified to do anything but point at the glass and make a whining sound in the back of my throat. The creature stooped down to look at me through the window. Its eyes were bright, wide, and almost crackling with barely contained aggression. That is a Sasquatch, Casimir explained. His tone was calm and detached as if he were delivering a classroom lecture. His name is Harry. I believe he was captured somewhere in the state of Washington. He's a big boy, this one. He weighs over 200 kilos. He is strong enough to tear a man in half. I gathered my courage and leaned a little closer to the window to get a better look at the Sasquatch's broad, simian features. His eyes narrowed and he wrinkled back his lips, bearing a set of strangely large canine teeth. At that same instant, an enormous fist slammed into the other side of the door, making a gigantic bang that sent me scrambling to hide behind Casimir. I peeked over his shoulder and yelled, Fucking way! No! That's a- that's- that's a- That's a fucking Sasquatch, man! Yes. I know. Kaz said patiently. The door across the hall is a storage room. It's where you'll find the equipment necessary to care for this creature. You do not need to feed this one. He forages from the plants that grow in his habitat. However, Harry must be groomed several times a week to keep him looking... handsome for the visitors. You will find a brush in the storage closet. Bring it to me and take a minute to calm yourself. It will be okay. Casimir will teach you well. I shot a quick glance at the growling brute on the other side of the reinforced glass. He showed his fangs again and I fled to the safety of the storage closet. I came out a few minutes later with a soft horse brush, which I passed over to Kaz, with hands that were visibly shaking. I cleared my throat and repeated, That's, that's, a, that's a fucking Sasquatch, man, right? It's a living, breathing, big-ass, friggin' big Bigfoot. It is, Kaz agreed, as he handed me his rifle. This is a tranquilizer gun. If Harry was to ever escape into the service tunnels, you must not hesitate to use it. Just push this safety switch forward, pull the trigger. Do you see this switch on the wall? 
it activates a two-way intercom. Make sure that it is on whenever one of us enters a cell. I shook my head and stammered, I, I, can't, I can't believe you're actually going in there with that thing. That's crazy. I'm no animal expert, but that thing looks pretty fucking mad. Harry is not a thing, Kazumi corrected, and he is only showing you that he is the boss. You are new to him. He perceives you as a threat. Now you should see him when he is actually angry. It is a sight to behold. I let out a nervous giggle and said, Oh yeah, he's definitely the boss. Look, for real, I don't think you should go in there. Casimir gave me a very slight ghost of a smile and shook his head. Harry is not a very intelligent beast. It's more like a dog. As long as I hold his brush, I'll be his best friend. He loves to be groomed. <laughs> Problem comes when you try to stop brushing him. This requires some teamwork, as you will see. Kaz showed the Sasquatch the brush through the window. Harry pursed his black lips in an ooh of excitement and moved back to allow Kaz to enter, doing a shuffling little jig of excitement as Kaz stepped into the habitat. I watched with my heart in my throat as Harry hunkered down in a clearing and allowed himself to be brushed. I could hear him cooing and chuffing to himself over the intercom as Kaz carefully worked the knots out of his fur. It would have been kind of adorable, really, except for the fact that I was afraid for Casimir's life. If the Sasquatch suddenly decided to tear his arms off, I don't think there would be much either one of us could do about it. Kaz would be bleeding out before I could even hit the alarm button. Kaz called out, Can you hear me? I gave him a thumbs up through the glass. He yelled, So when you are done with the grooming, you must run like hell for the door. Harry often becomes upset when the brushing has to stop. The code is 5542, okay? Make sure the door is open. Yes? Okay, I'm going to run for the door, right? Now! He suddenly whirled around and all out sprinted for the entrance. Harry jumped up with a blood-freezing roar and loped after Kaz on all fours, bellowing in savage indignation at the abrupt ending of his grooming session. Kaz leapt through the open door like a football player, diving into the end zone, and I slammed it shut a bare second before the Sasquatch hit the other side. The heavy steel hummed with the force of the new blow. Just a bit too slow. Both of us. Kaz panted. We will do it better next time. I sputtered. Next time? And suddenly I was sitting on the floor. Kaz reached down and hauled me to my feet. My legs immediately gave out and I slithered back to the floor. Kaz put his hands on his hips and grunted. I think you're being just a little bit dramatic, yes? I flailed my arms and screeched, Dramatic! Next time! Hell no! Shit! All over that! I was almost mauled by a Sasquatch, dude! What the fuck? I thought I'd be throwing birdseed to an ostrich or some shit, not getting murdered by a, a, a giant fucking ape! Kaz closed his eyes, let out a long breath, and leaned down and casually whacked me across the side of the head with a stiff slap. I looked up at him in shock, my head ringing from the brisk contact with his leather-clad palm. And he shook his head at me. Gently, he said, That's enough. I'll hear no more of this talk. You're making a fuss over nothing. Did something bad happen to you? No. Could anything bad happen to you? If you're not careful, yes. So be careful. But you always live to see another day. That isn't the big selling point you seem to think it is. I snapped back at him. Get on your feet, boy, Casimir sighed. There are more wonders awaiting you. Come and see. Kaz led me down the hall and asked, What do you know about leprechauns? I said, You gotta be kidding me. But no, she wasn't. The plate on the door was labeled Leprechaun. The leprechaun's name was Dara O'Sonnesy, and according to Kaz, he was, quote, a very angry little man. He thankfully didn't require much in the way of direct care. The main task with Dara was to pop in every few days and allow him to wheedle a trinket from our pockets. It was good for his mental health to acquire a shiny new treasure every so often, and he also enjoyed berating the caretakers for their shortcomings. He's not an evil creature, this one, 
but he always is far, but he is always in a foul mood. Being angry brings him joy. Fetch us an item from the chest in there, but only one. Victor would be displeased if we gave him more than one item at a time. I didn't know if leprechauns are dangerous, but I could only assume the average leprechaun would easily kick a human being's ass, hence the gift to win his continued cooperation. I found a wooden chest nestled in a corner of the storage room, and I was stunned to discover that it was full of gold coins, intricate jewelry, and polished gems of every description. I stared at its contents with my mouth hanging open. I was looking at millions of dollars worth of precious metals and gemstones. It was just casually nestled away in an open storage closet, a stockpile of expensive presents for some asshole leprechaun. The absurdity of it all made me want to laugh, cry, and scream bloody murder all at the same time. I blindly grabbed a small necklace from the top of the heap and dropped it into Kaz's hands. Oh, you will not be pleased with this at all, Kaz murmured. Wait and see. You will have some choice words for me today. Kaz made his entry, and I watched with open-mouthed fascination as Dara O'Sonnesy came stomping out of his earthen mound to confront his unwanted visitor. The leprechaun was three feet of red-faced fury in an emerald green waistcoat, complete with matching breeches and a smart-looking top hat. He glowered at Kaz and shouted, What unforgiven sins have I committed to be so cursed with your presence, you lumbering horse's ass? Kaz stoically ignored his insults and presented him with a necklace, a simple gold chain and locket combo. The leprechaun sneered at it and growled, I'm the star attraction of this smoldering dung heap, and this is the best you can do. Bloody fucking outrage, so it is. He asked if Dara needed anything, and the leprechaun snorted. I need you to fuck off out that door and stop bothering me. Say, who's that peeking through the window? Is that your new assistant? Does the sheep-faced bastard know what happened to the last one? Kaz hissed. Shush. He started for the door with the crackling leprechaun hot on his heels. Oh, so no one stole him. Good grace. Surely the lad deserves to know about the poor man's tragic fate. Surely someone should tell him about the... Kaz scrambled through the door and shut off the intercom, cutting Dara off mid-sentence. We stared at each other for an uncomfortable length of time. I said, What happened to the last guy, Casimir? What was this tragic fate the little guy was talking about? Huh? He did not listen. Casimir said quietly, and he did not take care. You, however, you will do both, and you will be fine, okay? Listen to Casimir, and you will be safe. What happened to him? I asked again, is he dead? Yes. Yes, he is dead. He did not listen, and he was killed. So it was his fault, I prodded, and Casimir gave me a reluctant nod. Yes, he did not listen that he paid for this with his life. It was very tragic. I closed my eyes tightly, and through gritted teeth I said, Okay. Sure. It was his own fault. He wasn't careful. So. So how did he die? Casimir jerked his head up at the ceiling, then leaned in close to whisper, not now. They're watching. A second later, I heard a loud click echoed from the speaker in the ceiling, and Vic's voice boomed. How we doing, folks? You good? How's you holding up, Kaz? Kaz looked up at one of the light fixtures and said, Very well, Victor. He's learning. The whole experience requires some adjustments, as you know. It really rattles the old brain cage at first, that's for sure, Vic agreed. You got told your whole life that shit ain't real, and then... You walk in this place and bam, here they are. Yeah, but it's a hell of a thing to wrap your head around, I get that. Vic stopped talking, and during the long pause that followed, Kaz darted a sharp glance at me and shook his head. His look quite clearly said, don't say a word. Well, I thought I'd check in and see how things are going for the new guy. <laughs> Carry on, fellas. Say, why don't you take an early break, huh? Take the kid outside, show him the grounds. You don't have any more direct contact work today, do you? Kaz told the light fixture, There is only one more. I saved the best for last. 
Ah, shit, the goblin. <laughs> Vic chuckled. I honestly kind of hate that fucking thing, creepy little bastard. Anyway, we'll take a break. Show him some of the cool stuff we got outside. Oh, one last thing. Send a kid to my office when guys are done with the goblin, okay? Talk later. Kaz turned to me with a stiff, unnatural grin and said, Come along then, boy. There is an exit over here. Let us get some fresh air. We stepped into the bright sunshine and fresh air, normal things from the normal world. I breathed in gratefully and said, How did he die, Kaz? What happened? Kaz growled at me to keep my voice down. They might hear you. There are listening devices everywhere. He steered me down a cobblestone pathway to a gazebo that was nestled beside a willow tree. The grounds were even more impressive up close. When you were walking beneath the elaborate archways and strolling across the rustic storybook bridges, the grounds had been landscaped to give off a vague medieval fantasy vibe, replete with small castles, mock-ups of peasant farmsteads, and whimsical statues of mythical monsters. At least I assumed they were mythical. After what I'd already seen this morning, I honestly wasn't so sure anymore. Kaz sat me down at a table in the gazebo and, speaking very softly, he told me, Victor had called my predecessor into his office the previous Thursday and shot him dead. Victor had reason to believe the assistant had been planning one way or another to blow the whistle on the zoo and take the whole operation down. I do not know how Victor discovered his intentions, Kaz cautioned me, but I think he probably keeps his employees under surveillance. Keep your secrets close, your opinions even closer. And never speak of them out loud. I turned this information over in my mind and then pointed out that Vic wanted me to come to his office after we were done. Kaz assured me that this would be fine, but added, You must understand this place is more than just an investment to Victor. It is his dream and his passion. He will not hesitate to dispose of anyone who threatens to destroy his dream. You must always take care in this place, especially with the others. My last assistant confided in the wrong person, I think. And now, he is dead. I grimaced and said, Duly noted. I'll definitely keep that in mind. I felt something gently nudge my leg under the table. I leaned down and came face to face with a large rabbit with antlers growing out of his head. We stared at each other for a few seconds, and then it nudged me again with its antler. Hey, Casimir, there's a rabbit with a, a horn down here? What the fuck? The jackalope, he said, as he lit a cigarette. Relax, she will not hurt you. Victor allows some of the more harmless creatures to roam free on the grounds. Her name is Clara. And a very long time ago, she was given as a gift to King Arthur. Now she lives at the zoo. I crooned. Hi, Clara. And she stretched up to plant her muddy paws in my lap and sniff at my shirt. She was twice the size of a normal jackrabbit. Her little antlers were adorable. And I think she likes me. And she responded by crawling fully into my lap, whacking me in the face with an antler in the process. I winced and scratched her behind the ears. I think she likes you as well, as we observed. She's normally a very shy creature, that one. I joked that maybe I could just look after Clara from that point on. Kaz shook his head. If only it could be so, he said, and he butted his smoke in a standing ashtray. We must get back inside soon and attend to the goblin. I asked if I could maybe grab my lunch bag from my car first. Kazmir shook his head. I do not think you will wish to eat before we see the goblin, he said. You may regret doing so on a full stomach. Come along and brace yourself for what you are about to witness. The goblin's name was Gort. As it turned out, Kaz was correct. Gort put me off the idea of eating lunch completely. 
Gort's habitat was dimly lit to the point of being almost completely dark. I squinted through the observation window and said, I can't see shit in here. Why is it so dark? Kaz explained that the goblins prefer low-light environments. He put a flashlight from his utility belt and shone it through the glass, illuminating the mouth of an artificial cave. I could see a number of small bones scattered on the floor, most of them broken and gnawed into splinters. We must go into Gort's cave and clean up his mess. He is a slovenly creature. Go into the storage closet, bring some garbage bags, broom and dustpan, and also a pair of night vision goggles on top of that. I was surprised to discover that night vision goggles actually looked a lot like a fancy zoom lens camera on a head harness. As Kaz adjusted the straps on the harness, I asked him, Is this thing dangerous? Should I be on standby with the Trank gun? Ugh. Gort could easily kill a man if he wanted to, Kaz admitted, but he has never been physically aggressive towards any of the caretakers. We provide him with an easy life, however, he is not a very pleasant fellow. He makes the leprechaun seem like a kindly old grandfather in comparison. Maybe he'll come out of his cave with his lantern and... Kaz entered the habitat and I was left squinting after him through the window. All I could hear over the intercom was a faint dry rasp of a broom as bones rattled into the dustpan, followed by the rustling of the garbage bag. The longer nothing happened, the more horrible Gort the Goblin became in my imagination. What kind of animal did these bones come from? What the hell does a goblin eat, anyway? Do they eat people? I thought they probably would, given the chance. I mean, why the hell not? Let's have a look at you. I whispered at the window. Come on, dude. Let's see your ugly ass in person. I leaned close to the glass, squinting into the darkness. Then a voice like a rusty hinge suddenly shrieked. That's right. Pick up me bones. Pick them all up. Look over there. It's a heap of dung. Pick it up, dung boy. Pick it all up. There was a peal of lunatic laughter, and the scene was abruptly illuminated by the chaotic light of a flickering lantern. The lantern was swinging around in the grasp of the grotesque, twisted horror with bulging yellow eyes. He looked like a cross between Mickey Rooney and a carnivorous toad. The goblin pointed at Casimir with a stubby claw and performed a shuffling dance of malevolent glee. He crowed, Put a scare in you, did I? Oh, that's right. Pick up my dung. Straight from me ass to your hands, dung boy. Hot and fresh, just like you like it. Kaz muttered something under his breath and carefully scooped up a large curl of excrement from the dustpan, much to the goblin's delight. He shook his fist and yelled, I need more rabbits, dung boy! I need more rabbits to turn into dung! Ha! <laughs> Just for you! You'll get more rabbits soon, Casimir grunted. His face was blank and emotionless. Step aside, please. I'm finished here. Are you sure you're done here? Gort sneered. If I find even one splinter of bone laying upon the floor, I swear... I'll wave my ass at the lords and ladies who come to gawk at me this eve. Stones, branch, and dirty asshole for all to see. I swear I will. You would not dare, Cosimir said in a dismissive tone. Victor would have you bound in chains and beaten with a horsewhip. Gort's brash smile faded into a weak and petulant snarl. He growled. They not abuse me in such a manner. They wouldn't dare. As I recall, they have already done so on several occasions. Kaz corrected him. He would have th I would have thought you would not wish to repeat this experience. However, I can deliver your message to Victor if you would like. They do no such thing, Gort stuttered. Tell him nothing. Kaz nodded and said, It's probably for the best. Step aside, you foul beast, and allow me to leave. The goblin bared his teeth in a cat-like hiss and trudged back. Casimir held the garbage bag away from his body, a faint look of disgust on his face, and he calmly made his way toward the exit. Enjoy your gift, dung boy! Gort shouted after him, 
and he slid the trap door and his lantern closed, plunging the entrance to his cave into a thick gloom. Come back for more whenever you please. Hot and fresh, just like you like it. Kaz serenely left the goblin behind to rant to himself, and he thrust the garbage bag into my hands before I could pull them away. The smell was... wild and explosively ripe. I could only imagine the god-awful stench within the confines of the goblin's habitat. He said, There's a chute for the incinerator behind the trapdoor on the wall. Get rid of this horrible thing. I choked. How could you breathe in there? And ran for the disposal chute. Old factory fatigue, he grinned. After a minute or two, your brain tells your nose to stop smelling the bad stuff. Kaz gestured at the exit of the end of the service tunnel. The code is the same as the door in the habitats. Victor will be waiting for you. Go on. I'll see you tomorrow. In an excitement of seeing my very first goblin, I had forgotten all about Victor Botticelli. My heart started pounding in my chest. I cleared my throat and squeaked. You... You think it's going to be okay, right? I mean, he's not going to... Uh, it is probably fine, Kaz said and he gave me another little shrug. A minimal gesture that said, maybe it will be so. Maybe not. Who knows? Kaz put a large Kevlar-gloved hand on my back and gave me a firm push toward the exit. You came face to face with a Sasquatch. You did not soil yourself, he said. You are made of sterner stuff than you think. Go now. Stay brave. I turned to give him a thumbs up. As soon as the door wheezed shut behind me, I leaned against the wall and started hyperventilating. I considered the possibilities of allowing myself a brief crying session before I went to see the man who may or may not shoot me dead in his office. But then I remembered. Vic might be watching me on camera, so I gritted my teeth. And I forced myself to stand up straight as an arrow. And I stopped blubbering to myself. Under my breath, I muttered, I just wanted a fucking job. Is that too much to ask? I uttered a silent prayer to whoever might be listening. And I headed out to face my possible doom. I opened the door to the lobby and realized I didn't actually know where the hell I was going. As it turned out, Vic had thoughtfully sent me one of his well-dressed goons to show me the way to his office. He was a brick wall of a human being with a shaved head and no neck at all just enormous trapezius muscles that connected to the back of his skull. He said, How you doing there? And somehow, it came out more like an aggressive accusation than a question. The boss wants to see you in his office. He led me across the vast lobby with this menacing snake-like statue, and we ducked through a small, unmarked door that opened into a large reception area. It was a tasteful, decorated space, with designer lounge chairs and Honest to goodness, a waterfall burbling out of one of the walls. The water cascaded over the edge of the opening and fell into a shallow pool below. The pool was contained inside an artificial rock basin that glittered with polished deposits of quartz and amethyst. I gawked like a child at the decadent display of splendor around us and I gasped. I've never seen anything like this before. Not in real life. I thought the lobby was something else, but this. This is just crazy. The goon glanced over his shoulder at me and grunted. This ain't crazy. This is some big money in action. The things Mr. Bonicelli got on display here, now that's... That shit's crazy. There was yet another door on the far side of the room, and it was guarded by an icy beauty who sat behind a long and gleaming reception desk. As we drew closer, it became apparent her features were a bit... Well, alien-looking. For lack of a better term, her eyes were almost cartoonishly large, and her nose was a small, fleshy nub nestled above the exaggerated bow of her upper lip. However, it was the elongated points of her ears that really gave her away. I stared at them in shock. Vic's hired muscle gave her a slight bow, then pointed at me with a finger that resembled a ballpark sausage with knuckle hair. He said, Good morning, Miss Dahlia. I brought this guy to see the boss. Speaking in a soft southern accent, Miss Dahlia purred, Good morning, Len, and favored him with a very slight of smiles. She looked over at me and added, 
Could you be an absolute honeycomb and tell this young man to stop staring at my ears, please? It's not very polite. Without bothering to look at me, Len growled, Mind your manners, Dumbo. Don't stare at Miss Dahlia. I stammered, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry, I, I didn't mean to. Shut it, Len commanded. I stopped talking and I looked down at my feet. Miss Dahlia curled her lips at me and picked up the phone. She said, he's here. And then, in a most frostier tone, Victor will see you now. Len gave me an unfriendly push towards the door. It's open. Go in. Victor's office was surprisingly small and plain in comparison to the reception area. He looked up at me from the other side of his desk and gave me a grin. Not much to look at, is it? I'm a simple guy, really. All the pomp and splendor out there is for the guests. That's what they pay for. Me? Me, I like something like, uh, more cozy, you know? <laughs> yeah, have a seat, kid. Vic offered me a box of cigars. I declined. He exclaimed, What, no cigar? I got him from our two Fanetti. You go great with whiskey, you sure? I stole a glance at the bottom of the Jameson Gold Reserve on his desk and said, Well, it's only 10.30 in the morning, but I'll definitely have a drink. Always past noon somewhere in the world. <laughs> Vic proclaimed with a smile, and he poured us both a generous slug and a cut crystal whiskey glass. He nipped the end off a cigar and lit it up with a low groan of contentment. Now I guess you're wondering to yourself, how the hell does a guy end up running a zoo for cryptids? <laughs> Bigfoot, leprechauns, all that shit. They ain't supposed to be real. Now you've seen them with your own eyes. They're just as real as you and me. Quite a shock, ain't it? Choosing my words carefully, I asked, what about the Bonesaw Vic part? I mean, that actually caught my attention more than, you know, the cryptid part. Vic leaned back and plopped his sneakered feet up on his desk. Okay, he exhaled. Time for a story. <laughs> so, I had my start working under a boss named Mario Ginetti. I called him Nichols. Because he always sit there rolling a shiny nickel back and forth between his knuckles. <laughs> anyway, I was a kid, only 12 years old. He could see I already had more balls and ambition than most of the grown men in his crew. Only position Nichols had for a young kid like me was be a runner for numbers games. That's what he did. I made drops for Nichols all over Brooklyn on my bike. It wasn't long before I was bringing home three, four times what my old man made as a janitor. Easy. I'll tell you something. A jealous old prick. Uh, he didn't like that too much. He started getting on my case how I was working for a criminal. <laughs> so I just tossed him ten bucks. You know, get him to piss away at the dog track. Usually kept him out of my business for a while. So everything's good for a while, right? And then a couple of mooks tried robbing me. Nah, I was 13 by then, maybe 14. They knocked me off my bike, pulled me into an alleyway. One of them holds up a knife, says, give me what's in the bag. So I, so as I opened it up, right? Pulled out a 38 special I always carried in there. Damn stupid motherfuckers got what was in the bag. I blinked at Vic from across the desk and murmured, Holy shit. Vic nodded in agreement. Anyhow, he continued, When I turned 18, Nichols let me join the crew. I was a collector and an enforcer. Uh, if you were ducking payments on your gambling debts, I'd be the one to come pay you a visit. If I were in a bar somewhere and the boss heard you cracking wise by another table, well, I'd be the one to walk over there and show you the error of your ways. I was good at my job. I enjoyed my work very much. Vic took a sip of his whiskey, basking away in the glow of those fond memories. It wasn't much longer before I started getting contracts. Guy fucks up. Gets his name put on a piece of paper. I'd be the last person he'd see in the world. Once again, I was good at my job. I enjoyed it. 
Lots of traveling around, seeing the sights. It was good. Good work. Despite my deep unease, I was fascinated with Vic's backstory. I said, I don't want to overstep my bounds or anything, but Vic flapped a hand at me and interjected. Stop, stop. I already know what you're going to say. You want to know how many, don't you? I'll tell you something, kid. I honestly lost count. There were a lot of names. A lot of faces. It was a long time ago. Anyway, in those days, I'd always carry a bone saw in the car. It's a lot easier to deal with them afterward if you'd... And, you know. Vic made a sawing motion and grinned. I tried to grin back, but failed miserably. So they started calling me Bonesaw Vic. I like that just fine. With a nickname like that, people always treat me like the utmost respect, you know. Yeah, one day I get a call about a scumbag. Wouldn't pay in his debts. Real hard on this guy. Nichols sent a couple of boys over to rattle his cage. Didn't go their way. Put them both in the hospital. Two big, tough guys. Put them both in the intensive care unit. So I tracked this guy down to a motel room somewhere, right? Kick in the door, put six in his chest. Pop, pop, pop. Do him right there and then. But he didn't die. Vic chuckled to himself and knocked back the rest of his whiskey. Right before my own eyes, raggy looking little fuck bounces off the floor, smashes through the window. I run outside after him, but he's gone. Just zoom. Gone in seconds, the blur down the road. Long story short, turns out the guy wasn't human. He was a vampire. <laughs> That's when I discovered the world of cryptozoology, kid. Fast forward 30 years. Here we are. Many questions. I pointed at the door and said, You receptionist, she's... She's not human either, is she? Vic snorted. Her? <laughs> Hell no, Miss Dahlia is a water nymph. Best secretary you can ever ask for, that gal. She used to live in a freshwater stream, right? So we siphoned off a bunch of the water. Made her that waterfall out there, I tell you. She, <laughs> she is never late for work. <laughs> I nodded my head and drained my glass. A water nymph? Oh, sure. Why not? I tentatively pushed the glass across the desk and tilted my head to the bottle. Vic crooned, Atta boy, and poured me another one. He slid it back in front of me and exhaled. So, yeah, I didn't call you in here to tell you my life story. First of all, I want you to know you did a great job in there today, kid. You didn't start crying like a bitch when that fucking Sasquatch came running at the door. He didn't try to run away, neither. No, those other guys, those other caretakers, uh, they're a pretty rough bunch. Soldiers, mercenaries, cutthroats, all that description. You went in there. You did what they do. That's something to be proud of. Most people, they couldn't do it. You got big brass balls, kid. <laughs> I'm proud of you. Maybe it's just the whiskey, but... Vic's praise went straight to my heart. I never had an employer say anything positive about me before. Not once. I felt my face flush red and I sputtered. <laughs> thank, thank you, Vic. Uh, I appreciate that. I'll, I'll try my best each and every day. I won't, uh, you know, I, I won't say anything to anyone about the place. I can keep a secret. Sure you can, Vic beamed. That's why I hired you. You did your time like a man. You didn't rat no one out. Tough little bastard. Tougher than you know. Stern stuff, I agreed, and held up my glass and a toast. Thank you, Vic. I mean it. Vic cautioned. Yeah, don't thank me yet. You ain't been inside one of them habitats yet. It's not different when you got Harry staring you in the eye and got no door between you. That's when you earn your money. And that reminds me. Vic stabbed the intercom button on his phone and said, Ms. Dahlia, can you bring in that envelope? The water nymph glided through the door and dropped the white envelope on the desk. 
She smelled faintly of moss, minerals, and rich, dark earth. And her hair fell like dusky waterfalls across her back. I realized I was staring at her again with my mouth agape, and I forced myself to look away. You're all wide eyes and racing heartbeats, aren't you, sugar? Miss Dahlia noted in a crisp, frosty tone. I stuttered an apology and looked down at my glass. I could feel my face burning with embarrassment. Miss Dahlia paused beside Vic on her way out of the room. She patted him on the shoulder and stage whispered, Don't let this baby boy anywhere near that succubus. So, Victor, the poor thing wouldn't stand a chance against that shameless hussy. He'll be fine, Miss Dahlia, Vic grumbled. Thank you, and that'll be all for now. She frowned at him and left, closing the door just a little too hard behind her. Vic shook his head and sighed. I'll tell you something, that pretty ones, they always hate each other. <laughs> anyway, figured you're probably kind of broke right now, am I right? Sure I am, I'm always right. This is a week's pay. He handed me the envelope. Call it a signing bonus. Get yourself a good haircut, maybe some new clothes. Take a nice girl out for dinner and a movie. Have a celebration. Made the cut. There's one thing you gotta... I stopped listening right after he said this week's pay because I was too busy staring into the envelope with my eyes bulging out of my head. I'd never seen so much money in my entire life. I blurted, thank you so much. And Vic abruptly stopped talking. His smile disappeared. He jabbed a finger in the air like a dagger and barked, shut up. I ain't done talking yet. You made the cut, yes, but I'm not. I'm gonna have to stress something here, okay? If you fuck this up, they will never find your body. You got me? Not one hair, not one tooth, not even a button off your shirt. You'll be gone. Do you understand me? I looked in the eye and saw that he wasn't a threat. Vic was simply telling the truth. I nodded and I croaked, yes, yes sir, I understand. He studied me for an agonizingly long period of time. I forced myself to hold his gaze and keep my expression neutral. The euphoric rush of holding all that back rent in my hand shriveled and died in the laser beam intensity of those searching eyes. I can't remember being keenly aware of compensation of that kind. I can remember being keenly aware of my own mortality and questioning if there was any amount of money that could adequately compensate for that kind of mortal terror. The answer was yes, of course, and the amount was whatever I was holding in my hands at that moment. I didn't have any other choice. I'd seen too much. There was no going back. And then it passed. And Vic slowly reclined in his chair, making the springs squeal and torment beneath the burden of his bulk. He puffed his cigar and wheezed at the ceiling. Yeah, I want to believe you're a good kid. I want to believe this. So I will. But don't you ever give me a reason to regret my faith in you. Capiche? Softly, I said. I'll never be anything but an asset to the organization, but... I'm a hard worker, and I... I'll never be the word to anyone. Promise. Vic pursed his lips and said, We'll see. He pushed a button on the keypad of his bulky desk phone, and seconds later, Len poked his head in through the door. We'll see you tomorrow, kid, Vic said, and his smile returned, transforming him from a murderous thug to fatherly businessman in the blink of an eye. Show up the same time as today. Go directly to the service tunnel. Kaz will be waiting for you. I tried to thank him one last time, but Vic waved me away and poured himself another drink. Big day tomorrow. You gotta get suited up for entry. Think you're ready. Go on, get out of here. Get yourself some lunch. As Len briskly marched me through the reception, I noticed an expensively dressed man sitting on one of the designer chairs. He was reading a newspaper and sipping a Perrier while he waited to see the boss. I took a closer look and recognized him as a very famous film director. He looked up and gave me a cordial nod as we passed. I turned to Len when we got to the lobby and started to say, Hey, was that? Len snapped. I don't know, loud mouth. Was it? 
I immediately stopped talking. The message was clear. Some things were not to be said out loud. At least not by the likes of me. A lowly caretaker's assistant. I was to be seen and not heard. Len followed me out of the gate to a golf cart and pushed the button to let me out. I stuck my arm out of the window to wave at him. They drove away, but it wasn't returned. The gate rolled shut behind me, clunk. And if it weren't for the envelope of cash stuffed in my pocket, I would have been tempted to believe the whole thing was a bizarre hallucination. But it wasn't a hallucination. I was the new caretaker's assistant at Bonesaw Dick's Cryptozoology Gardens. There was no turning back. I went straight home and slept for hours. I think I must have been in shock. I dreamed about four-mouthed boogeymen, elven beauties with raven hair, and gangsters with bone saws in their trunks for their cars. I woke up starving and ordered a deluxe pizza with garlic bread, wings, the whole works. I tipped the delivery guy 20 bucks. I ate like a king while I sat in the dark, watching the moon rise through the window as I sorted my troubled thoughts. The creatures in Vic's facility were inmates. Their habitats were jail cells. Some of them might belong there, but not all of them. Harry, for example, belonged in the wild, running free in a real forest with others of his kind. He wasn't necessarily good or evil. He, he, he just was. His only crime was daring to exist in a world that didn't believe in his existence. I thought about Kaz's threats to the goblin, about chains and horse whips. I knew that it wasn't right. The goblin might be repugnant and nasty, but what was his real crime? Not wanting to be gawked at by visitors? It was right. None of it was right. I was just about to call it a night when my eyes were drawn to a red glow on the street below. I saw a man leaning against a dark sedan, smoking a cigarette, yet staring up in my window. I guess I shouldn't have been surprised, but it made my heart beat a little faster regardless. I crawled into bed and I stared at the ceiling for a long time. Around one in the morning, I got up to take a leak and I took a peek out the window after I was done. Sure enough, he was still out there, sitting in the sedan, smoking in the dark. I took the money with me when I went back to bed, nuzzling up to the precious envelope like it was a teddy bear. I decided they could watch me all they wanted. Didn't matter. For better or worse, I'd hopped on this crazy train with my luggage in hand. But there was nothing I could do but come along for the ride. I fell asleep, and this time, I dreamt of nothing at all. In the morning, I didn't wake up as a nobody. I woke up as a caretaker's assistant. Despite the circumstances of my employment, I was excited for a new day. And I'm not going to lie felt pretty damn good. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Pasta, And as always, I want to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video. If you guys are interested in finding new books from authors that you hear of on this channel, please pay attention to the links in the description down below. For one, you can always get a hold of my books, which are the Creepypasta Collections Volume 1 and Volume 2, but also from a bunch of my other friends, such as Jack Townsend where Tales from the Gas Station Volume 4 is currently available. You can find a link in the description, as well as a link to all of my audiobooks I've done for Volumes 1 through 3. And yes, trust me, I'm going to be working on 4. It's just going to take me a while. And as always, I want to give a very big thank you to everybody who is on my Patreon. That means everybody. Everyone who is from the $1 tier all the way up to the God, why do you pledge that much tier? But I especially want to give a big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Kyle Resnack, Happy Birthday, Ollie Whale, David Martin, Scarrington the Unkempt, Angelus, Spanky, Snoochy Boochies, Autistic Spidey, Freddy, Seclude, Lupta Galvin, That Creepy Chick, Tyler Fletcher, Rebecca Harper, Merxenum, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier the Cheyenne, Demix, Sean Cato Baker, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Rob Likes Sharp Things, Chaos Arts, Cryolinian, Zachary Grafius, Lord Life's Best, Goreng Tri 
Levi Magacy, Maria Walker, Pain Gravy, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Aka Limchok, Dirt Diver 030, Matt Bach, Naughty Devil, Voice of Sands, Coffee Zombie, Matthew McNeese, Chelly J, Jeremy H, Reltazol, Ficomel, Nana, Deleted Account, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Darth Miver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Nessie, Bardo Hawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Sashi Suzaku, Croconut 509, Kaylee Ambrose, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Nicholas Zicardi, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Benjamin Wilvart, Kiri the Sloth, Fester's Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. As always, you guys are the MVPs. Everybody who's on that list, everybody who's on that Patreon, everybody who's in the description, thank you so much. And if you'd like to join this list of names that I horribly mispronounce, head over to patreon.com slash mrkvpasta. And as always, everyone, sweet dreams. <laughs>